The Apostle Paul says, even as we sang, we should not trust in ourselves, but in God, which raises the dead, who delivered us from so great a death, and doth deliver, in whom we trust that he will yet deliver us. So we have been delivered, we are being delivered, and praise the Lord when he comes back, we will be totally delivered. What a grand day that's going to be. No more frogs anywhere. <laughs> They're all going to be gone, man. Glory, glory. Hey, great to be with you. You know, uh, talking with some brothers this morning a bit, I'm real impressed with what the Lord's doing in your fellowship. There's guys that radically love Jesus and, and get it, understanding that holiness is not a got to, it's a get to. We get to be holy. Not that we gotta be, we get to be. Holiness, it means just as it sounds, being whole. Unholiness means there's things missing, there's an erosion, there's a loss, there's a lack. It's not happening. Holiness means being whole, whole in joy, whole with our families, whole before the people that we're linked to. And we get to be holy. And the Lord is in the process of doing that work. He has delivered us. He is delivering us. <laughs> and one day we will be delivered totally. Father, I really thank you for the work that you're doing in our hearts by your grace. Father, thank you for washing away my sins, for cleansing us with the blood of your son, that positionally we can be holy and come before you boldly and talk with you openly and receive from you expectantly. It's all because of the holiness that you've given to us through and in Christ Jesus. At the same time, Father, I thank you that you are making us practically to be men who are holy. That you are delivering us. And for the fellas, Lord, last night that took that stand, continue, Lord, to meet them today and be their strength, I pray. And Jesus, we so look forward to the time when you come back and we will be delivered totally. Father, we get weary of our flesh. We get worn down by the stuff that plagues us and the stuff that's around us. And yet we know that all of that does is produce within us a longing for heaven and to be with you when all things are going to be right and all things made new. Father, for these guys, my friends, for these brothers who have a love for you, Father, meet them this day as we go through the, the day and then into the evening and tomorrow too. Just continue to bless these guys. And I thank you, Father, for the depth of their love and the richness of their faith and the obvious love for each other that I sense in this congregation. Father, I thank you for Joe and I thank you for planting him in Philadelphia and I thank you for the word being heard and the heart you've given to him to pastor. And Father, I know that great pastors like that are the product of your grace and the result of men like this praying, encouraging, standing with, and standing beside. And so, Father, I just continue to ask that you would do something mighty and powerful at Calvary Chapel of Philadelphia and the other groups that are represented here as well. That, Father, the name of Jesus might be celebrated, that the reality of Jesus might be seen that Philadelphia and the surrounding area would be radically changed. Folks would get saved and be freed from the frogs and walk in holiness and live forever eternally in heaven. 
Father, bless, I pray, the fellowship. Bless Joe, we pray, and the other leaders. And it's in Jesus' name we ask this and for his glory. Thank you, Father. Amen. Amen. You guys are blessed. You know that to have a pastor like Joe, because I'll tell you, <laughs> when you travel around a bit, you realize that there's not a lot of places percentage wise where there's a congregation that has the opportunity to hear the word being taught straightforwardly, systematically, with profound simplicity. That's a real gift. It's a real, don't take it for granted, fellas. Don't take it for granted. A lot of times you don't know what you have until you don't have it anymore, until you move someplace else. And then you realize, man, that was grand. <laughs> well, listen, would you turn to 2 Corinthians? I want to continue our discussion and add some hopefully Holy Spirit revelation to what we talked about last night. Second Corinthians chapter 12. The Apostle Paul in Second Corinthians chapter 12 was talking about the revelations that he had being caught up into heaven. <laughs> And the things that he saw, he said, were indescribable, amazing. And then he says this, concerning what he saw and what took place, he said, now, verse 7 of 2 Corinthians chapter 12, he says this, Lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh. And the Greek word, by the way, brothers, is not like a thorn that you would see on a rose bush. But rather, the Greek word is a tent stake. The kind of thing you drive into the ground to hold the tent down. <laughs> Get the point? The Apostle Paul says, man, because of what I've seen and where I've been, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Now, for this thing, verse 8 says, I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. This tent stake that's driving me crazy. This thorn in the flesh, that's a pain to me, a problem for me. I sought the Lord three times, energetically is the idea there. Passionately, that the Lord might take this thorn in the flesh from me. But the Lord said to me, verse 9, mark this well, brothers, my grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength, the Lord says, is made perfect in your weakness. My strength, the Lord declares, is made perfect in your weakness. So Paul says, verse 9, Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my weaknesses, my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. The phrase there, rest upon me, is literally blanket me. Okay? All glory in my infirmity, all accept this problem, you see, that the power of Christ may continually blanket me. And therefore, verse 10, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then I am what? Strong. He came into my office a few weeks ago. 
He sat down in a chair across from me, and tears filled his eyes, rolled down his face. Now, that was a bit unusual, for you see, this guy was not given to emotions easily. He's a real man's man, strong in personality, and an outstanding leader in our fellowship. But he broke down that day and said, John, I don't understand. I said, what's going on, Jim? He said, you know my story. I got saved seven years ago, coming out here to the fellowship and, and hearing about the love of Christ and the finished work of the cross and the goodness of God's grace. He said, man, just drew me in. He says, you know what I was before, and I did. He was a druggie, and he was dealing in the valley. He was well-known in certain circles. <laughs> he was well-known by the police, you see. And the Lord radically touched him, as the Lord has radically touched a bunch of you, all of us in one way or another. And the Lord saved him that Sunday when he came down in our amphitheater and was baptized at the end of the service. And the Lord did something radical. A guy that was previously involved in all kinds of stuff that goes along with that scene was delivered instantaneously from his own addictions, was transformed miraculously. And man, his heart was ignited on fire with the passion for Jesus. And he became a very, very radical disciple of our Lord, of our hero. But now the years have passed by, and he sat there that day, and he was weeping, and I found myself saying, uh, yeah, I, I know your story. What's the deal? I don't understand. God took that craving for drugs away and all the other stuff that I was involved in, it was gone. When I opened up my heart to the Lord, when I was baptized in water, man, that stuff was left behind. And he says, for the last two months, though, it's come back to haunt me. The cravings, the temptation, I've even succumbed. I don't understand, John. I've given my heart to him. I, I, I'm involved in service for him. What's the deal? How come it's back and it's pulling at me stronger than ever? After years of being totally free, not giving it a thought, man, it's come back and it's, it's pulling on me. And he was broken. And I said, Jim, I've got two stories to tell you. I said, the first is about a guy who was also broken. He was broken literally, physically. For 38 years, he couldn't walk at all. He spent his days laying on a porch, a deck, by a pool there in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate, a pool called Bethesda. Bethesda means house of mercy. And, and the tradition was, the story was, that occasionally an angel would come down and stir the water up, and the first one that could get in when the water was stirred up would be healed of whatever infirmities or weaknesses they were struggling with. And this guy laid there year after year after year after year, one day, an itinerant rabbi came his way, looked him in the eye and said, do you want to be made whole? And this guy said, ah, <laughs> I don't have any man to help me. What a lame excuse, literally. <laughs> How often you hear that. People say, well, the reason I'm in my crippled condition, the reason that I can't walk in the way I'm supposed to is because there's 
nobody to help me. I've been trying to talk to Pastor Joel, but he's got a list of 10,000 people ahead of me to get to, and I don't have anybody to help me. This guy said that. I said, Jim, this guy said to Jesus, I don't have a man to help me. And Jesus said, you know the story. <laughs> Jesus said, rise, take up your bed and walk. And suddenly this guy, hearing the command of the Lord, chose to be obedient to the Lord because God's commandments are God's what? Enablements. Say it. God's commandments are God's enablements. The word itself, if I don't argue with it or don't explain why I can't do it, but simply respond to it, as I stand up, I will be able to stand. As I stretch out my withered hand, I'll be able to stretch out the hand. God tells me to love my wife. God tells you to be holy. God tells us to forgive. Well, I can't. You don't understand my wife or my kids or that person or whatever he might have done. It's just hurt me so badly. As you choose to forgive, as I decide to love, God meets me in the act. Are you with me? If I stretch out the hand, if I choose to make a move and stand, God will meet me at that moment. It's in the obedience of the command that the power is given. So he chose that day to stand. And suddenly he could stand. Whoopee! Man, after 38 years, man, he's, he's standing and he, he grabs his bed, making no provision for relapse, by the way. Didn't keep a bottle in the cupboard just in case of emergencies. <laughs> he grabbed his bed and he walked away. He, he was no, I mean, wouldn't you be too? Wouldn't you be thrilled if after 38 years of lameness, suddenly you're set free? Whoopee, whoopee. And the Pharisees came by and they said, hey, hey, hold on, buddy. Who told you to be carrying your bed? Don't you know that today's the Sabbath? That's illegal. And the guy says, well, yeah, but, but I've been healed. And, 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 and the guy that healed me, he, he told me to take up my bed and, and walk. And, and the Pharisees said, who healed you? Check this out. And the lame guy said, beats me. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. John, who tells the story, says he wist not, he did not know who it was who healed him. I mean, he was so thrilled about his healing. I understand, whoa, I'm walking. But he, he just went on his way, but he didn't know who it was that touched him that day. Whoopee, I'm free, I'm healed. Oh, hey, hey, as he went his way. And I said, Jim, that's story number one. Can I share with you story number two? He says, yeah, okay. This guy had a spring in his step. He was no lame dude. This guy had the ability to walk with authority. He walked with direction. He walked impressively. From the very beginning, he walked that way. Even when he was born, you see, he was a twin. And when his brother, his twin brother, came out of the mother right before him, uh, the Bible tells us this guy started grabbing the heel of his older brother to pull him back in the womb so he could get out first. The brothers I'm referring to, of course, Esau and Jacob, Jacob. Jacob, his name means heel snatcher. He was a guy that could could go for it, man. He knew what he wanted. He could grab it. He was an entrepreneur. He could make it happen. He grabbed Esau and said, hey, I'm going to put you back in number two, and I'm going to shoot out number one. Didn't work that way, but he made a valiant try. And he went through life, Jacob did, 
And he knew exactly what he wanted, where he was going. Again, you know the story, guys. It was Jacob with a gleam in his eye and a spring in his step. It was Jacob, the entrepreneur, the sharp guy who was able to manipulate and maneuver to gain the birthright and the blessing from his older brother. Through connivery and treachery, <laughs> through, through sheer chutzpah, he got his way, you see. And then he goes off into a far country, and, and again, you know the story. He works for his uncle who was named Laban. And he's there for a total of 20 years with his uncle Laban. And he is able to manipulate and maneuver even Laban, who himself was kind of a tricky fella. And, and he ends up a rich man, to make a long story short. Jacob, Jacob, from the very beginning, knowing what he wanted. Jacob, from the very beginning, pulling at his brother's heel. Jacob, from the very beginning, man, he was a guy that knew where he was going. And then it happened. After 20 years... He desired to go back home again. He takes all of his family, his 11 sons, his two wives and two concubines, if you would. All of his cattle, all of his sheep, all of his servants, which were many, all of his milch camels and all the rest, and they go their way. When news comes to him that day, Esau is coming. Your older brother, <laughs> that you, that you, through treachery and trickery, got the birthright from and the blessing from, you know, Esau. I know him. He's coming to greet you. Really? He's coming to greet you with 400 men. It's not a good sign. And so Jacob, a guy that knew what to do, you see, he sent three waves of messengers with camels and sheep and goats and all the rest to try and appease Esau with these gifts, livestock, goodies. But the word still came back, Esau's on his way. And that night, the night before he would meet with Esau the next day, Jacob is by a river called Jabok. And I said, Jim, he goes by this river puts his kids on one side, crosses over to the other, and he there is wrestling, wondering, struggling with what's going to happen the next day when Esau comes his way. When suddenly the angel of the Lord appears to him. The angel of the Lord is a name for the pre-incarnate Christ. Before Jesus came as the babe of Bethlehem, he would appear in the Old Testament from time to time, and he would be called the angel of the Lord. And Jacob sees him, and Jacob lunges towards him, and Jacob wrestles him. And, and they, they wrestle. Jacob and the Lord, they wrestle there. You know the story, many of you, there in Genesis 32. They wrestle all night long. And Jacob says, I, I, I can't let you go until you bless me. I can't let you go. I've got a problem. I've got Esau coming around the bend. I need you desperately. I need you to bless me. And the Lord says, what's your name? Now, it wasn't that the Lord didn't know his name. The Lord wanted him to admit who he was. My name is Yaakov, Jacob, which means heel snatcher. I'm a tricky guy. Good. And they wrestled some more. And then it says the Lord touched his hip and dislocated it. And then the Lord says to Jacob, hey, now that your hip is dislocated today, I want you to know something. You're no longer Jacob. You are now from here on to be known as Israel, which means governed by God. For you are governed by God from this point on. Jacob, Israel, 
a prince before God, governed by God. Jacob, Israel, his hip dislocated. And the story ends in this way. From that time on, Jacob changed. No longer tricky, sneaky, treacherous kind of personality, but governed by God. But he had to limp through life. Listen, he had to limp through life. He had to lean on a stick and every step he took, no longer with self-assurance and entrepreneurial confidence, no longer with a spring in his step, now he would limp through life, but he would no longer be Jacob. He would be governed by God. He would be reminded, listen carefully, he would be reminded every step that he took that he had to lean on God just like he leaned on that rod, that cane. And the Bible says this. The last verse of Genesis 32 tells me, tells you, to this day, the Jewish people, to this day, will not eat the hip of an animal a sheep or a cow or a pig, certainly. They will not eat the hip of an animal. Why? Because they honor their father, Jacob. What, John? What was that? They honor their pops. Not when he was Mr. Entrepreneur, Mr. Skillful Guy, but when he limped through life, they realized as a broken man who every step he took he would have to lean on God even as he leaned on that cane from that day on. He was changed from Jacob to Israel. So I tell Jim this story, and Jim says, I don't get it. What are you getting at, John? Maybe that's what you're saying right now as well. Just this. One guy was lame, and he was healed. Whoopee! He's free. He goes his way. Who healed you? Beats me. I don't know. The other guy walked with a spring. He was together, you see. And then he was broken and he became lame. And he knew God intimately. From that day on, his name no longer Jacob but Israel. And I said, Jim, here's the deal. Here's where you're at. Here's what's going on. Here's why the craving is there, while the, why the frog is back croaking and calling. Here's what's happening. When you were first saved, when you were first born again some years back, the Lord healed you, delivered you, freed you miraculously, completely. He, he, he gave you a gift. And that was fine for those days, for that time. But when you're free and delivered completely, and you're not limping and you're not struggling, but you're walking, you go, whoopee, I'm free. When everything is going fine, hey, it's hunky-dory, wonderful. And you go your way, celebrating your liberty, enjoying your freedom. That's good, that's fine, but, 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 but. You don't know him intimately. Who healed you? Oh, I don't know. I'm just so happy. Whoopee. I'm just so glad that I'm I, I don't, didn't ask. I'm healed. I'm delivered. I'm free. Jim, that's what happened to you. You were set free and you love the Lord, but now. After these years, the Lord is doing a deeper work in you. He's not giving deliverance to you. He must be your deliverer, and there's a difference. It's not something he gives to you. It's something he is for you step by step, day by day. The craving the struggle, the temptation, the very real pull is probably going to be there all the days of your life. What? Uh-huh. 
Jesus didn't say, I have come to show you the way. He said, I am the way. He didn't say, I have come to give you bread. He says, I am the bread. He didn't say, I'm going to point you to the door. He says, I am the door. In other words, it's not something I give to you. It's who I am for you, step by step, moment by moment, day by day, that you might not be Jacob, but that you might be governed by me and your kids. Just like Jacob's kids will say, my dad, it was not his success, his togetherness, it was that he limped through life, leaning on God every single day that worked in him a character, a depth, something radical, something rich. Listen, brothers, please don't tune me out here. I, I, I got to have you get this. Because if you last night stood up and said, okay, I've given this frog to the Lord today, I realize it's got to go. I've got to tell you that you are going to find when you get back to Philadelphia or wherever you came from, you're going to hear that croaking again. And you're going to say, I don't understand. I, I stood up. I, I, I gave my heart to the Lord. I opened my soul before the Lord. I called out in sincerity, Lord, free me. And, and why is this frog still croaking then, you see? Because the Lord is not giving you deliverance. He is your deliverer. And you and I are going to have to lean on him every single step, every single day. If you have been delivered previously, praise the Lord. But I'm going to tell you the truth. He'll bring you to a point sooner or later where you're not going to be delivered. But rather, you're going to have to say like Jacob, I'm going to have to limp through life, leaning on you, Lord, or I'm not going to make it today. The pull of pornography is too strong. The temptation for pride is too great. My laziness, my temper, the, 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 the drink, whatever it might be, the, 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 the temptation to lie or to cheat on, on the income taxes is just so great within me. And the Lord says, I'm not giving you something I am someone that you'll lean on. Now you say, John, why wouldn't he just set me free? And that's what Jim said a few weeks ago in my study. Why, why wouldn't he just set me free? Does he want me to be codependent on him? <laughs> What's the deal, John? Here's the deal, brothers. Our Lord is not being mean, saying, limp, be crippled, struggle, be miserable. I could set you free, but I'm not going to. You're going to have to depend on me one step at a time, one day, each day, every day of every week from here till you move on to eternity. Ha ha. It's not it. Listen, guys. If we were set free like that lame man by the pool of Bethesda that day, he knows something. We'll go our way and we will not know him in intimacy. And that means I will not be blessed in all kinds of other areas because I limp through life and I do. There are issues in my life where every single day I struggle and I have to say, Lord, if you're not there for me today, if I'm not walking with you now, I will poof, fall. But because I'm in that position where I've got to lean on him or I poof, fall, guess what I find? All kinds of other blessings and understandings and riches, all kinds of other great, great glories that I would have never discovered had I not been forced to lean on him every step, every day. In other words, the Lord says, John, I know this is going to be uncomfortable for you, but you see, 
it's going to force you to lean on me with this issue because as you lean on me for that issue, you are going to discover in me all kinds of other riches and blessings and glories that you would have never discovered had you gone whoopee, you see. That's the issue, brothers. And I said to that brother, Jim, that day, you have your choice, Jim. Whether you want to be a whoopee guy and not know the Lord, or whether you want to be a Jacob who was dislocated, limped, crippled all of his days, but was changed from Jacob to Israel governed by God, respected by his family, became the father, if you would, of the tribes of Israel, became huge historically, important spiritually, rewarded eternally. What do you want to be? Whoopi? We don't even know that guy's name, Mr. Whoopi. We don't even know his name. We don't know who he was. He was, woo, I'm free. Jacob, we all know, we study, we love, we learn from Jacob, Israel. There's a nation named after him right now, governed by God. Who do you want to be? Your kids, just like Jacob's children, are not interested in your whoopiness. They're interested in how you have limped through life and leaned on the Lord, and from that, the richness that's come your way. A week ago yesterday, I was blown away. I was sharing with Joe, with Bill. I drove into the cemetery, and I couldn't believe it as I drove in through the gates right then. On the radio, As I pulled in, I heard my pastor, and Joe's pastor, and Bill's pastor, Chuck Smith, begin his program, The Word for Today, by telling us that we're listening, turn in your Bibles, he said, to Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. And it hit me like a bolt of lightning, and I began to weep. Oh, that verse, many of you know it. I know the thoughts I think towards you, thoughts of peace and not of evil to bring you to a glorious end. And I sat there in my Volkswagen bug at the cemetery, weeping and listening to Chuck preach from that text, which means so much to me. You see, I had just finished preaching, and I said to my wife, let's break away tomorrow. Let's go to Mount Bachelor and go skiing. And she said, okay, let's do it. And so the next morning that day, we rose up early, got in our car and drove up Highway 42 towards Mount Bachelor when I was telling my wife a joke and she was laughing, which was for my jokes, that's a miracle. <laughs> Not that she would laugh, but that my joke would bring that about. And she was laughing and I was laughing and our car hit a patch of ice and spun around and wrapped around a redwood tree. The next thing I knew, I was about 400 yards from the car that was wrapped around the tree crawling on the highway when finally a car had come up over Highway 42, it's a rather remote road, and saw me in the middle of the highway and saw the car ahead and stopped and called for an ambulance. I remember nothing until I woke up in the ambulance and the medic was looking at me and I looked him in the eye and I said, how's my wife? And he said, she's doing fine. 
And I said, no, she's not. And I said, yes, she is. For I said, she's in heaven. And he had to make a decision, that medic, right then. He knew that I was in shock, and yet he looked at me and said, you're right. She's no longer with us. And as I laid there on that gurney in that ambulance as a 29-year-old man, the Lord spoke to me. I don't use that term loosely. I don't use it lightly. But God truly spoke to me. I don't know if it was audible. It seemed to me that it was. It might as well have been. And God spoke to me, and he said this, I know the thoughts I think towards you, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to bring you to a glorious end. I didn't know at that time that I even knew that verse. Oh, no doubt I had read it, but I never preached on it, never heard a sermon about it. Now it's well known. It's talked about a lot. But back then, I had never heard any teaching from it or on it. Didn't even know that I knew it. Jeremiah 29, 11. I know the thoughts I think towards you, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to bring you to a glorious end. The ambulance arrived at the hospital. I woke up, saw my folks, and I said, God spoke to my heart. Don't even know if it's a verse exactly. I think it is. I don't know where it's found, but God told me, I know the thoughts I think towards you, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to bring you to an expected or a glorious end. And my mom and dad looked at me, and they were weeping, of course, for my wife, Terry, for my condition. The phone rang. I picked up the phone Actually, it was handed to me because, you see, it was a call that they knew that I would want to take. It was from Pastor Chuck. And Pastor Chuck said, John, he said, there's something I've got to share with you. I said, what's that, Chuck? He said, the Lord would have you know, I know the thoughts I think towards you, thoughts of peace and not of evil to bring you to an expected or a glorious end. And as I laid there banged up somewhat, tears were truly flowing down my face. I said, Chuck, I just told my parents just a moment ago that that was the thing, word for word, literally, that the Lord told me in the ambulance coming down from the mountain. And I was blown away. My wife was taken to heaven. And for those next years, I had the opportunity to raise my one-year-old and my two-year-old and my five-year-old as a single parent. I didn't know a thing about diaper changing or about cooking or about any of that stuff. And it was amazing. After I got out of the hospital, I took my kids away right away to just get them out of the valley that we live in, away from people and the rest, and just spend time with them. I came back on a Saturday night late from that camping trip, and I sat there on the sofa. Christy, who was one, and Jesse, who was two, their diapers were dirty. I hadn't changed them in a few days. <laughs> <laughs> and I brought the stuff in the front room <clears throat> just <clears throat> spread it out and I sat down and I was going to preach the next day and I found myself bawling and I, I said Lord why what's the deal why not why but why you see I never felt why never 
because the Lord, from the time I was in the ambulance and gave me the word to the time when my pastor called and confirmed it again, the Lord had given me this unbelievable, supernatural, inexplicable peace. And the Lord again spoke to me on the couch. This was only four and a half days after the accident. And I would preach that next Sunday and the Lord spoke to me and he, he said again to me, John, I've promised you a peace that passes understanding, haven't I? Yes, Lord. And I've given you a peace that passes understanding, haven't I? Yeah, Lord, you have. Then John, never seek peace that comes from understanding. I've given you a peace that passes understanding, and I understood. See, if, if, if I say why, and he said, here's why, then I would say, well, yeah, but why not, and how come, and what if, and he would say, and we would argue endlessly. The Lord says, I'm going to give you a peace, a peace that bypasses your understanding. Never seek peace that comes from understanding. Because you'll argue. I'm just going to jump. Your, your brain is so puny and so confused. I'm just going to bypass your understanding and give you peace in your heart. Peace that passes understanding. And he said to me very, very unmistakably, I've given you a peace that passes understanding. Never seek peace that comes from understanding. Just receive my peace. Okay, Lord. And for those next months, those next years, it was interesting because a peace was there every day, all the way. I was, and still am, in love with Terry. Very, very special, very beautiful lady. And my heart was broken when she was taken to heaven. But the Lord met me at that time with a peace that was, that was unreal, amazing. Even when, oh my goodness, I, I, I didn't know how to mother and I'd fix my girl's hair with pigtails and, and, and as the years went on and I tried to learn how to, we ate okay, uh, but it was weird like SpaghettiOs and raw carrots and, and uh, and, uh, you know, sliced up pears would be a, a meal that we would have. And it was nutritious, but man, after three and a half years, my kids were delighted when I said I'm getting married again. <laughs> they had enough of SpaghettiOs. And peanut butter was a big deal. I got addicted to peanut butter. Talk about frogs. <laughs> Adam's peanut butter, the kind you stir up, you know, where the oil is, you know, there at the top. And then you stir it in and all the rest. One night I go out and I'm hungry, so I get a great big serving spoon and I just dip it into the peanut butter and I take a great big huge bite of this peanut butter. It was midnight. I had just finished doing the dishes and stuff and cleaning the house and I took this stuff, this peanut butter, and it got stuck in my throat. <laughs> and I thought, oh no. I ran over to the refrigerator, opened it up, took out that plastic gallon and began to chug the milk, you know and the milk wouldn't knock it down, it just came out. And you know, I, I usually have a beard and it was just kind of running down my beard and, and I thought, I'm dying and Peter John's gonna wake up and he's gonna find his dad dead with peanut butter in his mouth and milk in his beard. And I went over to the hot water tap and luckily I just finished the dishes and I kicked that baby on and it was still hot so it kind of, you know, as I put my mouth on the nozzle, the hot water just kind of burned out the peanut butter. And I'm here to tell the story. But I'll tell you, it was, it was interesting and it was amazing and all the rest you see. And yet in those years, when I was single raising my kids, the Lord was there, faithful. He was there. He was there. It's true. It's true the story of Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego who were cast into the fiery furnace and and, and their hair wasn't singed and their clothes didn't smell like smoke. The only thing that happened was the ropes that bound them up were what? Burned off. And they were walking around in the fire. And Nebi says, how many men did we throw in there? 
And one of Nebuchadnezzar's aides says, three, your nebbiness. Well, how is it then that I see four and the fourth man is like the son of God? And Nebuchadnezzar finally orders Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, come out. But what struck me in that story at that time when I was single parenting, it's true. I understood. I saw it. It's real. That is this. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they could have walked out anytime they wanted to. I mean, who's going to say, get back in there if, you, if you're walking around in a fire with the Son of God beside you. The guards aren't going to say, you know, they were burned up, the guards were, who tossed them in previously. It was so hot. They're not going to... Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego could have walked out any time they wanted to, but they didn't leave the fire because the Son of God was with them in the fire. They would rather be in the fire perceiving the presence and person of Jesus Christ than out of the fire where it was cooler and more comfortable, but not having that same perception. Are you with me? They would rather be in the fire perceiving Jesus and seeing Jesus because the Lord promises to be with you and promises to be with me when we go through the fiery trial, the difficulty. He's there. And I go, yes, it's true, Lord. This is tough for me. Raising these three kids and missing my wife, Terry, passionately missing her. But Lord, you're with me. You are so real to me. You are so there for me. You do exactly what you promised to. You are an ever-present help in the time of need. You're here in the fire. And you know, I've learned, it's better to be in the fire, perceiving the Lord. That's a better, richer, funner, more exciting, more thrilling, more satisfying place to be than out of the fire where it's cooler, but you're not quite as perceptive as, of his presence, you see. Fellas, the Lord said, I'm giving you a peace. And he did. The Lord said, I'm with you in the fire. And he was. And then after four years, the Lord brought to me a new bride. We had a couple more kids, Mary Elizabeth and Benjamin. And, and, and God's just been good to me with my family. And I was sitting there, yes, I was sitting there in the pew towards the back on November 15th of 1994. Three years ago last Friday. Sitting there as a proud pops. For you see, we have morning worship at our church every morning for an hour from 6.30 to 7.30. It's communion is served and candlelight service and worship happens and people come and go and it's a real special way to start the day. But we're way out in the sticks. We are way, way far away out in this little place called Applegate. So that day as I sat there on November 15th, 1994, I was thrilled as I once again saw my daughter come into morning worship. She, she drove her car up the hill to the church in the opposite direction from her school as she would regularly do because you see, she loves the Lord real passionately. In fact, the week before that, November 15th of 94, I was teaching on our mountaintop retreat center which is behind our church, the book of Revelation. And I taught it over the weekend Jesse, my daughter, was there. And, and when I was doing the closed heart session on Saturday night, I said, now, now, who here has something to share from Revelation that we haven't yet talked over or thought through or looked at? My daughter, Jess, raised her hand and says, Dad, she says, Daddy, when you sent us out last hour to do some contemplation, she said, I, I haven't seen this before. She says, but did you notice the way that the last seven bowl judgments, when there's wrath being poured out, the seven bowls, how each of those last seven bowls relates perfectly to the last seven sayings of Christ on the cross. And she went from bowl one to saying one, bowl two to saying two, bowl three to saying three. 
She's 16 years old. And she gave this profound message, as she would do frequently, about the seven bowls relating to the seven words of Christ, something which I had never heard, read, or thought of before. And when she was done, we all just kind of sat there, and I said, this retreat's over. What more can be said? That's it. That's it. That's it. I'm done. And everybody clapped, and that was Jess. Ah, Jess, a Bible student, a Bible teacher at 16 that could in many ways out-teach me. What you're saying, that's not saying much, but for me it was. <laughs> Head cheerleader, <clears throat> straight-A student, loved life, leader in the church, not just of the high school, but of the church, really. She was a real worshiper and a student of the Scripture. And I'm sitting there, November 15th, and, and she comes in, and once more she goes up front and takes communion and goes back. And then Rick Vesney, my worship leader, our great, great, dear, close friend of mine, he says, as he leads that meeting every morning, he says, who here has a prayer you'd like to offer? And my daughter, Jessie, who's sitting right there, and I'm back in the corner, and she stands up and she says, Lord, I thank you for the promises of your word. She says, Lord, I thank you for the promise. I know the thoughts I think towards you, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to bring you to a glorious end. The amazing thing about that is my daughter Jess never heard the story I told you about what that verse meant to me. I only shared it with three people besides my parents. I never went into that for reasons that I can't fully explain. I never went into that story with Jesse or Peter, John or Christy or Ben or Mary. They're little, obviously. But Rick, my brother, my friend, he knew what that verse meant to me. The guy that was leading the service, he knew what that verse meant to me. And, and his eyes began to well up a bit because he knew he's got kids that are teens too and his kids are walking with God radically as well. And and he knew what that verse meant to me. And so right then, Rick did what Rick does. He wrote a song right then. He, he writes these songs when I preach. He, he, he'll play music after I'm done. He'll just write a song right then. And he wrote this song, Jeremiah 29, 11, because he knew what that verse meant to me. And he knew how I must have felt as a pops right then, hearing that being prayed by my daughter. And she prayed that prayer, and Rick sang that song, I know the thoughts I think towards you. And then Jessie got up, and she had to get to school, and she walked out the door, and she winked at me and gave me a thumbs up and smiled. And I'm just sitting there taking in the song and just thinking about that verse and how blessed I've been. Five minutes later, there's a tap on my shoulder. One of the fellows says, John, there's been an accident. So I got in my car, went down the hill. Went into my house and I thought, this can't be. This just, it, it's, this cannot be. There's a mistake. It's, they didn't know for sure. I, it can't be. And my wife ran out the door and screamed and grabbed me. And Peter John, my son, who was then 18, says, Dad, Dad. Dad, he grabbed me and says, Dad, she found the man. She found the man. See, the night before, that November 15th, I sat down with Peter, Jesse, and Christy. And I said, girls, Peter was listening in, you make sure that when you get married, that you don't just marry a Christian <laughs> that you marry rather somebody who can lead you, who's ahead of you, who's stronger than you, who can really lead you. And my daughter, Jessie, looked at me and joked and says, well, daddy, she says, where am I gonna find that man? She says, if I went to a good church, I'd have a chance maybe. And she laughed and Peter laughed and Christy laughed and I didn't. 
I laughed. Where am I going to find that man? And that's why Peter John grabbed me and says, Daddy, Dad, Dad, she's found the man. She's found the man that can lead her. And then Peter and I jumped in the car and went out to where the accident was. I had not yet been on the site. It was amazing to me, for you see, my daughter Jessie was taken to heaven. The last thing that I heard from her was Jeremiah 29, 11. I know the thoughts I think towards you, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to bring you to a glorious end. That's the last word I heard from her. The same verse the Lord gave me when her mom was taken to heaven so unexpectedly. The same verse that Chuck called me with and said, this is the word of the Lord for you. My daughter, Jess, didn't know that story, prayed that prayer and out the door and Rick writes the song and, and there it is in heaven. And she died with her car spinning on a patch of ice the autopsy, she died with the exact same injury that took her mother, my wife. Same side of the head, same exact blow. It was precisely the same. In heaven. And so last Father's Day, my boy Peter John comes back home from Vanuatu where he's running our mission base there. Vanuatu's in the South Seas. Peter's an outstanding Bible teacher. And he comes home, he's only home for about a week, less than that really. And he and my daughter Christy, Peter's now 21, and, and he and my daughter Christy who's 17. It was Father's Day, you see, and after services, they said, Dad, we're going to go into town and, and get a burger and a shake, and we'll be back. And I said, oh, come on, guys. And, you know, the grandparents are coming over, and all the family's showing up, and are you sure you got to go now? We'll be right back. And I was ticked off because I wanted to be there, you know, helping get the lawn done and the leaves raked up and the place all set to go. So what did I do as a dad? I'll tell you what I did. As they're getting in the car, I go out to the front yard, I take the mower and I fire it up, hoping they'll get the hint. It's Father's Day and here's Pops mowing the lawn. <laughs> we'll be right back, Dad, they said. <laughs> and they drove away and, and these kids are, are great. I, but they went away and I'm kind of fuming. Well, what, can't they see it's Father's Day and the family's coming over, the grandparents and the in-laws and all the rest. And I'm mowing the lawn, it's Sunday afternoon and all the rest. <laughs> Then I got a call and it was the cops. It was the sheriff and said, John, you better get over here right away. And I drove in my car and I couldn't believe what I saw. My two kids, Peter, John and Christy, driving down the road towards town, a Dodge Ram ran through a stop sign and plowed into my daughter's car she was driving and crushed it completely. My kids, Peter, John, and Christy, shot through the windshield, went out on the pavement, and were both miraculously unhurt. But here's the thing. I got there on the scene, and I just stood there, and I was stunned because that car that was pancaked ended up in the gates, crushed against the gates of the cemetery where Jesse and Terry are buried. What's the statistical odds of my two older kids having their car crushed and bashed into the very cemetery where their mom and sister is? Coincidence? I think not. And I hugged my kids, and that's a whole other story in itself. But I began to feel things deep within me. Lord, Lord, Lord. And that is why when a week ago yesterday, when I went to that same cemetery to place flowers at the graveside of my 
my daughter and my wife because it was the anniversary, the three-year anniversary of Jesse's going to heaven. Do you understand? That's why I was blown away when the radio was on. I pulled into the cemetery and Pastor Chuck said over the airwaves, turn to Jeremiah 29, 11. You may say it's all coincidental. You may say that whole story, that whole thing, you're, it's just coincidental. I say, I don't have that much faith. I don't have that much faith to believe that that could be coincidental. You have more faith than me if you believe that. Well, what are you saying, John? Just this, I limp through life. I limp. I limp. There isn't a day that goes by where I don't spend a chunk of time thinking about my daughter, who was the star of my kids, really. She was the star. My kids are all great. Jess was the star. I think about that. I deal with it. My wife, I was telling Joe and Bill last night, I, I still am in love with Terry. Now, I'm in love with Tammy, my new bride. Well, how can that be? Because God just enlarges the heart. It's like, you know this, Dad, when you hold your firstborn kid, you say, oh, I could never love another kid like this one until number two comes your way. <laughs> it's amazing what happens. But I want to share with you something, and I'll let you go. And that's this. You limp through life. Oh, I wish I didn't have to go there. I wish I didn't have to <clears throat> be put through those things. I wish I could have avoided it in some ways. But you know, I would not know the Lord like I do if I wasn't forced to every day say, Lord, I'm hurting. Lord, there's a thing in my heart that's aching. Lord, there's some struggles going on within me and I've got to limp and I lean on the Lord. And I have found over the years that as I lean on the Lord, having my wife in heaven, having been a single dad, having buried my daughter and gone through what I still go through, it's absolutely necessary because... That's why I know the Lord like I do. I needed that. I needed that. I need that still. Some guys say, whoopee! Who healed you? I don't know. Other guys like you and like me, we limp. Whether it's a pain, a sorrow, a sadness, whether it's an addiction, a temptation, a pull, a lust, a pro I don't care what it is. The fact of the matter is we limp. And the Lord says, it's necessary. Don't resent the temptation. Don't succumb to it. Don't give in to it. But don't resent it. Embrace the problem. Embrace the pain. It's the thorn in the flesh the tent stake that is driven into the soil of your soul. It's the tent stake that the Lord would say, even as Paul said that day, deliver me, Lord, deliver me from this pain. Deliver me from this problem. The Lord says, Paul, my grace is sufficient for you, Paul. And my strength, Paul, is made perfect in your weakness not in your whoopee. It's when you're struggling, Paul. That's when my strength will blanket you, will cover you, when my presence will be perceived by you, when like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you will sense me in the fire of your temptation, in the heat of your problem. You'll sense me, you'll see me, and you will say, I would rather be here because, Lord, you're so awesome than out there where all the whooping's going on, because I know you, Lord, and you are all that you claim to be.
life and peace and joy and fulfillment and your holiness surrounds me. Your holiness surrounds me. You are mercy and light. No darkness at all. Lord, there's no depression or darkness in you. Listen, brothers, I am done. Please listen. You're such gracious, kind men to give me this kind of time at one sitting. But listen, you got to know this because when you go out those doors, drive out that lot and go back home again, you that stood up last night, you're going to hear the croaking of the frog once more. Don't resent it. Don't say, it didn't work. Another disappointment. <laughs> Went to that retreat, heard Bill Gallatin and Joe and some guy from Oregon. Made a stand, was sincere, and man, now the temptation is stronger than ever. Or the pain is deeper than ever. Or the lust is hotter than ever. What's the deal? You gotta remember, God's not into whoopee. He's into making you men who lean on him one step at a time, who say, Lord, if I don't lean on you today, I fall. If I don't lean on you this hour, I'm down. If I don't receive from you right now, Lord, I will not make it. It's not something you give to me. It's who you are for me day by day, moment by moment, step by step. It's you, Lord. It's you. I've got to have you. And the Lord says, that's it. It's me, because when you lean on me, you find blessings in all areas of life. You're leaning on me because you're struggling with porno, but as you lean on me, you're going to learn how to be a good dad. You're going to be a parent to your children in a way that you never would have been had you not been forced to lean on me step by step. You're going to know how to, how to be successful on the job site in a way that you wouldn't have had you not been forced to lean on me because of this porno problem, you see. The very thing that you resent, receive. The very thing that you say, get this tent stake out of here. Remember what Paul would say. Paul would say, in weakness, you find his strength. Therefore, I will glory in my weaknesses, in my infirmity. Brothers, you're going to do well. How do I know that? Because I've been there. We're all in this thing together. All of us, <clears throat> preachers, brothers, musicians, elders, old Christians, new believers, we're all in this thing together. Mommy, mommy, mommy. We heard the cry. Tammy and I went in and Mary, who was four years old, said, mommy, I've gotta go potty, okay? So Tammy and I popped in the bathroom where Mary and Ben were taking a bath, you see, sharing the tub together, and Tammy reached down and picked up Mary and put her on the proper facility. Mary did her thing. Back in the tub she went. And then I said, Ben, who was in the tub with Mary, he was three, Benny, you got to go potty too? And Ben, who's got great big nose and big hands, he's a linebacker kind of guy. He says, nah, he says, when I got to go potty, I just go in the tub. <laughs> Mary's eyes got as big as saucers. <laughs> she turns around and she looks at Ben. And that was the last time they ever took a bath together. Let me tell you something, dear brothers. Let me tell you something, dear brothers. We're all in this tub together. <laughs> We're all in this tub together. Yeah, there's hurts and temptations and sadnesses and challenges. Embrace it, embrace it, embrace it, because he is causing you to lean on him. Not something he'll give to you, but he will be the one for you that will bless you then in every area of life. When the frogs are croaking, and believe me, they'll be croaking. Don't say, well, what's happening? 
Jim, I said to that buddy, that friend in my office that day, it's a new stage in your Christian development. No longer something from him, but it's just simply him. And Jim said, got it, John. And now he's embracing the temptation, not succumbing, but embracing, knowing that it's causing him to lean on his Lord. Father, bless these men. I know that you are calling us to be whole and holy. And I know, Father, the very real challenges that will be around the next bend for each of us, for we are all in this thing together. But, Father, I also know that most importantly, that your Son, our hero and leader and Savior, Jesus, was tempted in all points like as we are. He's with us in the same tub. He knows, Father, what we're struggling with. Thank you, Jesus, for knowing what we are going through. And I pray, Lord, that as our faithful high priest, our closest friend, that you would help these men who took a stand last night, that you would let them, Lord, <clears throat> understand what's happening when the frogs are croaking again, that they would just lean on you, Lord, for you are exactly who you said you would be, our strength, our hope, our life, our joy. You are there. We bless you. Where would we be without you, Lord? You are so awesome and so good. And on this Chesapeake Bay today, us guys just want to say you are so good. We would be totally lost without you. Life would make no sense. We would just be finished and wiped out. But Lord, you are so good to us and we bless you. And may we be Israel, governed by you, step by step, day by day. Bless these men. Bless them in Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Good deal. God is good.